Okay, so I'm not going to actually do the options section. Blah, 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 potato crisps. So uh, why do you use a non-polar solvent? Well, if you remember, uh, like dissolves like, uh, which would get you no points. But you'd have to say that uh, the non-polar fat would dissolve in the non-polar solvent. So that's your first answer there, is that you have to know that the non-polar fat, so fat is mostly just uh, hydrocarbons, mostly uh, alkyl chains. The non-polar fat dissolves in the non-polar solvent. Oh man. Is this rock in the camera here? Oh, whatever. Okay, that's one point. Uh, why didn't you heat this mixture of oil and volatile solvent strongly? Well, I imagine because uh, if you think about it, it might catch fire, mightn't it? So what is that here? So flammable and uh, it has a low boiling point. Yeah, so you just had to say it's flammable. I only had one experience like that at college. I accidentally heated ether, uh, which boils at 36. I heated it on a steam bath, it exploded. It was kind of stupid. Alrighty. Next one, so non-polar solvents. So the non-polar solvent, they're suggesting it could be something like, I suppose, gasoline or something like that, kerosene. So it's, uh, it can be toxic. How can I collect it? But what they do in industry, instead of just heating up the solvent and it blows off into the atmosphere, they do collect it. And what you can do is you can cool it down. And as it cools, it will turn from the vapor phase into the liquid phase. So that's called condensing. So you need to add a, a, a condenser. You need to add a condenser, uh, which is, I suppose, similar to distillation. So I think if I put both of those words on there, Distillation also cools down the gas and turns it to a liquid. Is that going to get me a point? Uh, do not accept condensation without experimental details. Oh, and the experimental details of condensation is distillation. So I got the point. All righty. So you soak the crisps in oil. So you soak the crisps in solvent that remove the oil. And then uh, you drove off the solvent, just leaving the oil behind. But there's a greater mass than you expected. Well, I would imagine that you didn't drive off all the solvent that you expected, and some of it was still left there in the oil. That could be one explanation. The other explanation, I think, probably, uh, maybe it wasn't just the oil that dissolved. Maybe there was some other funky part of the crisp that also dissolved. I don't know, maybe carbohydrates. I'm just making up biology words. So not all the solvent evaporated is for one point. Or there are other substances that dissolved. Yep. Yeah. So if there's too much, if it looks like there's too much oil, that's not all the solvent evaporated. Evaporated. And so the other thing, let's say there's too little oil. Well, what happened? You added the solvent, you drove it off, and there's too little oil. So maybe some of the oil was driven off with the solvent. Maybe there's some light oils. That could be one reason. Uh, Kind of struggling, mate. That's what I can think of. Oh, not all of the oil extracted. Of course, I feel kind of stupid. So the reason you didn't get enough oil, maybe you didn't shake it up enough, maybe you didn't crush it enough, maybe you didn't leave it to soak enough, because not all of the oil transferred into the solvent. So too little oil. So not all the oil, not all the oil is extracted. Hmm. Okay. Question two is uh, an IA that you could consider doing. So that's esterification. Remember, esterification is where you add a carboxylic acid and an alcohol, concentrated sulfuric acid catalyst, and you make an ester and water. Uh, the ester, most of them smell nice. They're used as flavorings and, uh, and solvents as well. When I first started teaching, the cheap board markers that I used to write with. It was a three hour lesson, can you imagine, teaching college? And I would write along the board and I'd end up giggling at the end of the lesson. I didn't know why I was so happy. I, 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 in hindsight, I think I was getting a high on the ester solvents. Uh, yeah, don't sniff solvents. It doesn't do, doesn't do your brain any good at all. Alrighty. So, 
identify the independent and dependent variable. So the independent variable is the one that you change. So they change their, well, you change the number of carbons in the chain. And the dependent variable it was what you measured after you messed about with the independent variable. And so that looks like it, it looks like it's Kc. The dependent variable was Kc. Have we got here? Chain length or number of carbons, yep. And dependent variable is equilibrium constant. Okay, that was well answered. Now the ice bath. So once you've got your equilibrium set, uh, you want to throw it into an ice bath and that will kind of freeze the equilibrium in position. Uh, because as you cool something down, uh, there's less collisions per unit time and there's less energy greater than activation energy for those collisions of the reactants. So what's the question? Uh, no. So we'll keep talking about that for a second. And so that's why it's a nice IA. You freeze this reaction and then while it's frozen, you get on and do some measurements. Now don't forget when you chill an equilibrium, that will also shift to the exothermic side. Uh, so that can't be that much of a problem. Otherwise, if it was, that we wouldn't use that technique. So uh, why would throwing a large amount of water into a reaction also slow it down? Yeah, if you throw a large bunch of water, uh, you're diluting it. And so there's going to be less collisions per unit time for the reactants. So uh, diluting it, less frequent collisions. Uh, it doesn't even say for the reactants. There we go. So adding water slows it down. One point for diluting. And another point for a less frequent collisions. Next up, a rapid titration. So why do you have to do this titration quickly? So you've done your experiment, you've got your esters here. Well, in fact, you've got everything's present, isn't it? Because it's an equilibrium. You've chilled the thing, so it's basically frozen that equilibrium in position. And now you better do the titration quickly. Uh, so why do you've got to do it quick? Well, as you do the titration with sodium hydroxide, sodium hydroxide reacts with the acid. So it's gonna react with this acid and that acid. But if you take your sweet time about it, as the carboxylic acid here is reacted, the equilibrium will shift to the left and replace it. That's the nature of equilibrium. System and equilibrium, when you stress it, it moves to oppose the stress. So if you took all day, as you remove this carboxylic acid, it would shift left and replace it and you wouldn't get the results that you want. And also, uh, neutralization is exothermic, so it's also warming it up as you do that. So what's their answer? Uh, equilibrium shifts to the left. Is that it, just for one point? No. More ethanoic acid is produced as equilibrium shifts to the left, so that's it. So you've got to do it quickly, otherwise uh, your reaction is going to shift left. And why was it going to shift left? To, uh, I should, uh, to replace the ethanoic acid. Replace the ethanoic acid. All right, next up, 2D. Additional equipment was conducted. A little, little, little. Yeah, so the idea of the experiment is I want to know how much carboxylic acid I've got left when equilibrium's reached. If I know that, I can do some calculations, work out Kc. Hmm. But the sodium hydroxide will also react with this concentrated sulfuric acid. Hmm. So I want to subtract the amount of concentrated sulfuric acid, uh, sodium hydroxide, from my, from my calculation. I'm just interested in the carboxylic acid. I'm just interested in this one, not the catalyst. So I'm going to have to account for the catalyst that I added by by doing it just with the concentrated sulfuric acid to determine uh, to eliminate reduce systematic error caused by the acid catalyst yeah that's it so it's to account for the uh, to account for the catalyst account for the catalyst mm -hmm. eliminate reduce account for lovely okay 2e 
calculate the percentage uncertainty and the percentage error. So percentage uncertainty is the uh, uncertainty over the value times 100. So let's have a look for methanol. <laughs> okay, it was experiment one. The methanol, yeah. So I'm going to take my uncertainty divided by the value times 100. So it's going to be 0 0.4 divided by 6.5 times 100. So I'm going to stick with one sig fig because uncertainties are normally there. So it's going to be plus or minus 6%. So if my results are out by less than 6%, I can blame the equipment because that was out by 6%. So for my percent error, I'm going to be doing uh, experimental minus theoretical divided by theoretical times 100. And so my experimental is 6.5 and my theoretical is 5.3. So I've got 6.5 minus 5.3 over 100. Uh, sorry, over 5.3 times 100. Okay, so that's 23% uh, to two sig figs. It's one decimal place. Two sig figs, two sig figments. Okay, so that's 23% is my percent error. Is that right? Yeah. Comment on the magnitude of the random and systematic errors in this experiment using your answers. Random and systematic errors. So the random errors are to do with the percent uncertainty. I could be out by plus six, I could be out by minus six. Who knows what's going on there? It's a random error from the equipment. So plus or minus 6%, I don't know, is that big or small? I'm not really sure. The percent error, well, let's have a look. The percent error, I'm out by 23%. Let's go back to the original data. Now, comparing the experimental to the theoretical, it looks like it looks like the theoretical is always smaller. It's always smaller, always smaller, always smaller. So that must mean there's a systematic error. A systematic error pushes your data always in one direction. In this case, my experimental values are always bigger than the theoretical. So there's something consistently wrong, a systematic error. Think about if you were to measure your height with your shoes on, you're always going to be too tall. That's a systematic error. So the systematic error, there is a systematic error, yet I would say that the uh, experimental data is always too high. And the random, so you can't really blame the equipment. Your equipment's got a 6% uncertainty and you're popping 23% error. So I would say that the random error is smaller than the systematic error, so you can't blame the equipment. Uh, that would be my answer. So the random error is smaller than the percent error. So it's not uh, the equipment's fault. Not the equipment's fault. I get my points. Percentage error. Uh, so large percentage error means large systematic error. Oh, I think my answer is better than that. They just said it was a large percentage error. Okay. Uh, and a random error is smaller than a systematic error. So I, I think my answers are better. So there we go. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I still like my answers. Question 2G. Suggest a risk of using sulfuric acid as a catalyst. Sulfuric acid is corrosive. You get it in your eyes, you go blind. Uh, so uh, it's just a dangerous chemical if not used correctly. So corrosive burns, irritating, strong oxidizing agent. Don't accept health risk or hazardous. So they'll accept corrosive. Oh, I think so. It's corrosive. Yeah. OK. 
throat it. So I think I probably would have got a couple of points off there, but I still like my answers. We're done. <laughs>